Okay. Thank you. You see, Jang, you were, you were in the middle of my screen, and therefore it was easy for me to remember. Last week, you were you were off to the side. Um, I, I just wanted to, to mention the sunbeam behind me, this really bright spot right about there. It makes me sad. My uh, my uh, my older cat used to uh, used to sleep in that sunbeam. Unfortunately, she passed away a few months ago, just at the beginning of the course. So, so it's making me sad today, which is why I'm happy that people were smiling and made me feel better. Okay. When you were about to uh, join this course, you didn't know that you'd be learning about my cat, did you? Things you learn. Okay, uh, let me share a screen. Let me share the screen. Let me move that off of there. Okay, I, I've gone old school and written down all my notes on paper. So last week, I did everything via my terminal. And obviously that is okay if you're just trying to get some information out of an application quickly. Uh, oftentimes you're going to be doing what we call one-offs, right? So somebody says, hey, can you grab me all this information about all the books in the library? There's nothing built into the app that does that, but you have access to the database, so it's easy enough for you to get it. You actually have people whose job it is full-time to take care of databases. Um, I'm glad I'm not one of them, but I'm also glad that I know how to do it if I need to massage information out of the database. So, okay, let me go to... Um, Okay, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna turn this off. Okay, and never put spaces in your file names. Okay, um, does anybody have any questions about how I did that? No, there's a command in Unix that I found out actually rather recently called take, which does the same thing as create a directory and then move you into that directory. So if I take a directory name, it will create the directory, move me into the directory, without me having to type two commands. So a little tip for you all. Okay, so I, let's create a, let's open up my code editor. Okay, so I have, as you could see, a brand spanking new empty uh, empty directory. So. I want to create a node application and I'm going to have that node application connect to the database I created last week. Um, and I think the easiest way to do this is to actually start off with a, a command line application. So we're going to we're going to be able to access our database with this node app through the command line. So uh, if I want to start a node app, what's the first command I should type? Anyone? N NPM init. You got it, sir. There we go. Sure, apps with SQL is a great name. Version one, why not? We'll just take all of the defaults. OK, great. So I've got that. Okay, so the next thing I need to do is 
I need to uh, import some dependencies. Maybe. So I'm going to, in order to access the database, I need to have a particular node package. Because we have Postgres installed, uh, the name is actually quite easy. It's EG. There we go. So I now have PG in my app. I'm going to create a index.js. OK. So let's get started. Uh, the first thing I want to do in this app is um, require the module, OK? Okay, so I'm just doing the require PG, super. Okay, the next thing I want to do is use this package to actually connect to the database. So this is only going to work with the database I'm connecting to. So let's start this. So const, um, we're gonna say client equals, G dot client just to make things easier I'm going to create a configuration object and within the config object I am going to put in the parameters that I need in order to access my database so I need a user which in my database is actually, yeah, no, user is Postgres. Database is uh, library. My super secret, oh, see, always look at what you're typing. Okay, and finally, my super secret password. And my super secret password today is Postgres. Okay, super. All right, so, Now, I, I, I see a potential problem here. If I want to share this code with you, I need to share, obviously, what I've typed here, this config object. And all right, I don't care if anybody sees that particular password. Um, but in a production environment, I don't want people to see my password. So how do I move these out of this file and somewhere else where I don't have to worry about it. So if I just do a git push, you know, create a git repository for this, my password's going to be there for all to see. So what I'm going to do is use another library. It's called dot env. And yes, it is spelled D-O-T-E-N-V. OK, and what this library does is allow me to import my configuration items from elsewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to And just to make my life a little easier, I'm just going to require it and immediately run the config method off of it. So instead of assigning require.env to a constant and then running uh, .env.config, I'm just doing it this way. It's, it's effectively the same thing. Okay, so 
if I don't want to have these here and I want to have them elsewhere, how do I do that? Well, what I can do is it can create a file, surprisingly, called .env. And within here, I can actually put the variables that I want to hold outside of my app. So I'm going to save a variable called dv underscore user. Uh, capitalization is important. This is its own kind of language. And I'm And I could put anything I want to out here. Now, it's still going to cause me some issues, right? Because if I save this directory to Git, this is still going to get saved. So how do I stop Git from recognizing this file? Does it Git ignore? You got it, Pontiac, yes. Yeah, it's dot get again. There we go. And I could just put here dot env. There we go. So now this is going to stay outside of git. And let me just initialize the git repo. Oh, okay. Uh, don't worry about this error. This is because I'm running extra stuff. You're not going to get this same error. Um, I need this to run for professionally. So this is a utility. I have a lot of different environments on my computer, and this just helps swap between different environments. It's a, a, a piece of software called DirEnv. So you're not going to have to type DirEnv allow unless you decide to use that software yourself. This will just work without that. So getting back to it, I now have done this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do git add dot and git oh, plus 163. Uh, so I, my prompt tells me how many files uh, are, are not, are going to be added. And I don't want to add all of that. So how do I, let me show you a cool cheat. You can go back here. No, it's not, not going to stash changes. I'm just going to remove everything from the stash. And I am going to add to my git ignore. Oh, come on, git ignore. I'm going to add my node modules. There we go. And then you can do a git add dot. That's way better. Uh, git commit dash m. OK, great. So you'll notice that VS Code here has kind of grayed out the dot env. This just means that this file is not under version control. This also helps when you have to install a piece of software into several different environments, say a staging environment, a production environment, a development environment, and all of them have different um, databases and such set up. Okay, so let's get back to where we were. That was a little bit of an aside. So how do I use it here? All I need to do is pull that in with something that should look familiar to everybody. It's process.env dot, and then the name of the uh, variable that I've created before. So let me. 
Let me just copy this. And we will uh, data and all right. And now this will read what we call environment variables here. So what I'm going to do just to help you out when you come to this later and you uh, want to download it. I'm just gonna create an example. And in here, I am just going to put in um, So hopefully that, that helps you if you need to go back and look at the, uh, oh, and I should probably call this database. So I remapped my uh, caps lock key, so I can't actually use that when I want to type in all caps. So I have to keep my finger on the shift key. Makes it very hard to type, but I don't need to do that very often. So not a big deal. John, can you remind me, um, process.env and, and what's, how is that related to process.argv? So process.argv are the arguments that you pass in to a node uh, a node program from the command line. The process.env are environment variables that are set up. For instance, every machine has environment variables. So uh, things like if you type, um, I think it's echo uh, dollar, uh, to name, I think we'll see in a moment. Okay, it's not that, um, but there are environment variables that are set up uh, in your in your machine, or at least Unix-based machines. Windows things happen a little bit differently, and these are variables that are, all programs running on that environment have access to. So all I've done is for this folder only created new environment variables. And this is what the .env package does. So this is very much like uh, process.argv, but it, you don't have to manually add it. Got it, thanks. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Thank you for asking the question. Okay. Hmm? Um, yeah, so... Um... I have a question. Um, yeah. So in order to connect to database each time, we need to have these three keys uh, for the config object. It, do we need to have user and password? I mean, database, yeah, I got that. Um, it doesn't hurt to have all of that. Uh, I could have put user and database here, but remember, again, I might wanna run this program in different environments, right? So maybe instead of, the, a uh, database that's called library. Maybe instead I have a database uh, called um, production underscore library and staging underscore library for different environments that I want to run my program in. So I can have different ENV files for each environment that I'm running it in. So that's one of the main reasons to do that. Also, uh, you don't want to have your password. So one of the one of the big problems with GitHub and and somebody noticed this years ago is a lot of people forget to add their .env to their 
git ignore file. And a lot of people actually have real passwords in their, uh, it's not as common as it used to be, but you, you're still gonna find some uh, projects still have passwords. And actually that's one of the ways that people break into um, uh, uh, data, data leaks come from. I think uh, a couple days ago, I got an email from Kickstarter. I, you know, I do Kickstarter occasionally, and they said, "Yep, we 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 got uh, your your uh, email address leaked uh, because of something like that." It wasn't Kickstarter; it was something else, something like Kickstarter. Um, it, it's a newbie mistake, uh, so just remember that. If you are saving something to Git and it is not a private repo, the entire world can see it. So treat everything that you wanna have secret as a secret and don't save it to Git. Okay. If you, uh, if you add a file to Git ignore after you've already synced it to Git, you then have to manually delete you it off. You do right? have to go and, and manually delete it from uh, GitHub. There is a, uh, a web page, like it's so common that GitHub has instructions on how to do that. Uh, if you just search their documentation for it. I had to do that myself, uh, what, four months ago, just before I started here. So it happens, it happens. It wasn't that big a deal, uh, but it's, uh, it was a private repository anyways, but still, you don't want to save keys to somewhere where other people can get at them. All right, let's have a look to make sure that our, uh, our config object is coming through the way I expect. So let me just console.log the config object. All right, and let's note index.js. There we go. Database is undefined. And why is that? Ah, right, because it, uh, it I didn't change it. That's why. I didn't save it, I guess, for whatever reason. Okay, uh, and I, again, I, you don't have to do this, but I do. There we go. So run my program again and all of the config items are in there, despite them not being actually in my index.js. Okay, so now that I know that works, let's actually create the client. Let me use the new keyword. And I'm gonna pass this. So when I'm talking about a client here, this is a database client. So this is going to connect to a database and run operations on it. So now I've done that, the next thing I need to do is connect. So let's try this. Point dot connect. And this is a promise-based API. And because it's promise-based, I can use a dot then. So this is an asynchronous function. Databases happen asynchronously, just like uh, API calls. So database can take some time to run. Uh, it will be milliseconds for any project that I have, this library, I believe has six records total, but it is run asynchronously. So I'm going to do a callback, which is say, and I'm also going to have some error handling here. I'm going to run dot catch, and that is going to take the error if it happens, and console dot 
error. And we'll say and then we'll pass in the error. Okay. So everybody good with what this does? Okay, I have I'm connecting to the client. If it's successful, line 18 will run and I should see DB connected. If I'm unsuccessful, the catch will happen and then it'll say you goofed and the error will pop back on the screen. So let's run it again, make sure it works. Not that it is. Go. Config object is not defined and that's because There we go. <laughs> Always make sure you uh, use the right variable names. Perfect. So the database is connected. You might notice something, and that is that the I'm still in the program. So the database is connected, but it's not doing anything because I haven't told the database connection to close. So I'm gonna quit this. And what we can do is we can add uh, what we call a dot finally. Dot finally, just like dot then and dot catch will run asynchronously, dot finally will be the last thing that runs. And the last thing that I want to have happen, it has to be an anonymous callback. And that is uh, dot um, end. Okay. So it's going to connect, it's gonna say DB connected, and then it should close. So let's try that again. And there we go. It connected. I didn't do anything and it disconnected. Great. That's actually what I need to do. So what do I want this program to do? I want it to go through the books in my library and do particular actions with those books. So the first thing I want to do and uh, I actually hadn't heard of this term before. Normally, I've mentioned CRUD. What does CRUD stand for? Anyone? Create, read, update, delete. You got it. Create, read, update, and delete. There is another term called bread, which is create, read, edit, add, and sorry, browse, read, edit, add, and delete. Uh, so it's the new fashion term for CRUD. Um, it sounds more appetizing, that's for sure. Unless you're gluten intolerant, like my kid, in which case, no. So we're going to run some bread uh, actions here. So. First thing I'm going to do is I am going to create a browse action. Okay, so const browse. And I'm going to make it a function. And it's going to be multi line. So what I'm going to do is do a client query. Uh, client.query and now here is where I put in my SQL, my SQL statement. If I want to read all of the books in the books table and return that value, what do I need to, what is the, the query, the, the SQL query? Select asterisk from 
library, is it? Or yeah. yeah. It's actually from books. But you got most of it correct. Right, the books table in the library. Exactly. Database. Now that I've connected to the library database, I don't need to worry about ever mentioning library again. It knows that it's in the library database. Now I'm only concerned with table names. So I'm going to say select star from books. And I'm just going to add an order by. say ID. Okay, so I'm querying. This too is a promise. And because it's a promise, I can then run a then. It is a venable function. Not every function is venable, but anything that runs asynchronously like this is venable. I didn't know that was a word, but it is. Do you need the semicolon after the SQL? No, no, you don't. But that is actually a very good point. Um, I'm going to put it in because it makes me feel better. But in actuality, the this library will automatically add the semicolon if you've not put it in yourself. But excellent, uh, excellent point. So we're we've got this, and we're going to get a response. So let's get our response object. And what do I want to do with the response object? So let's do, I'm starting to get the flying V or the, uh, what's called uh, the, um, all back hell. But uh, luckily, it's not going too deep. So we're console.logging the response dot rows. And that's just what it's called uh, when you get, it, get that response object from the PG library. It's called something else in MySQL. So every library is going to be slightly different. And you just have to look up what the documentation says. So in this case, we're going to run console.log response.rows. And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to comment this one out because I it's going to confuse people. It's going to confuse me when I say people. OK, and what I'm going to do is just run browse. OK. Everybody clear on what's happening here? I've created a function, and then I'm immediately calling that function. That function will access my database. It will run that query on that database and will write to the console the response, or at least the data out of the response. So let's do this again, and let's Save node index. .jit. What am I doing wrong? Book or books? Oh, should be books. Yeah, from books. Yeah, and I'm just going to get rid of this configuration object, which is also confusing me. So let's have a look. Ah, interesting. So let's go and see what's going on. Okay, uh, I'm going to connect with my, uh, what is it? PSQL dash U. Uh, but, uh, John, yeah. uh, do you need that connect, the client connect? Like, you know how in yes. jQuery, you need, yes. um, yeah, it has that's to be inside. exactly what's going mm -hmm. on. Thank you. Yep. So I am going to run, before I run the browse, I'm going to run this client.connect. And actually, I'm going to uncomment these three lines. 
because I've got it running already. All right, let's run it again. Control D, let's run it again. Bingo. So I now have a command line way to get the names of all of the books and write it to the console. And because everybody here understands Node, you can understand what you can do with it. So let's uh, let's expand the functionality. Although, does anybody notice what's going on here? I'm still within the the database, right? I've not ended it. So what I should do here is do a client dot end. And that will stop it after it does the read because it's a command line uh, command line app, and I only need the database for the, the the query. Okay, so I've got this browse. As you can imagine, I can create different functions. So let's create a different function. And I'm gonna create a, let's comment this out for a bit. I'm gonna create another function called and it's gonna be similar to the above, except that it's going to need an ID. So how, what's a good way for me to pass some a piece of information into a node program? Uh, you could store it in a variable. Yep. So how, uh, how would I do that? Say uh, I want to pass it in through the command line itself. Process.r? And uh, I happen to know that index two. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be index two. All right, I'm actually going to make it index three, and I'll I'll, I'll explain why in a, in a moment, uh, because I want to pass in something else. So I have created this ID here, and. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do the same sort of thing I've done up here, except that I am going to change the query, right? I've got select star from books order by ID. Here, I want to get a particular book. So if I want to get, say, say I've got an ID of two, let's say I want to bring uh, or, or get the, uh, the book number two, which in this case is Game of Thrones, right? So what is the SQL query that I would need to do that? Um, select um, star from books where ID goes to order. Exactly. Okay, so I, I just need to change the string so I can pass in a variable. Now, you might think, well, I can just change these uh, to backticks and That should work. Don't do it this way. Remember last week where I showed how easy it was to uh, send whatever string you wanted to, to a database? So what if I call this and I pass it drop tables? 
So what we're doing here is we're just using the second uh, second argument as a or it's unsanitized. So we're just passing it in raw. We don't care what it says. But we know that in data, databases, this can be very, very dangerous. So what we want to do is we want to sanitize the inputs. And we can we do that quite easily by changing this. Instead of using that, we're going to use, um, what is it? It is dollar one. And let me just change this back to a normal string. I don't have to, but hey. And then I can pass in an array of values that will replace. So dollar one has a specific, a specific meaning here. It means take the first member of this array and replace it with whatever is this array. I can have this array as many items as I want because I can keep passing things in. So I could have dollar two, dollar three, dollar four, dollar five. This will sanitize it so that you don't have to worry about dropping tables or somebody being malicious, at least in that manner. Okay, so we've got this and everything else actually can stay the same. Okay, so what I wanna do is I want to run browse or read depending on the second, or, or, or the first um, argument that I pass into the command line program, right? So what I'm going to do is create a, a variable up here. I'm gonna call this variable verb for the HTTP verb. And this is where I'm going to use the process.argv2. So I want it to run browse or read, depending on what that second uh, argument is. Okay. What's a good way for me to do that? What what what's the second argument uh, you're referring to? So the first argument here is going to be the verb. So I want it to run browse or read depending on what the verb is. The second argument, if you add it, is going to be the ID. And the ID only means something if it's a read in this case. Now, thinking ahead, I could add a number of different features to this. So I could have a way for, to delete a book or add a book. So I'm just doing this step-by-step step, though. So what I can do is I've got browse and read here and I've got the verb. So a good, well, maybe not good, but a way of doing this is with the switch statement, right? And a switch statement, I always have to look this up. So I, yep, I have to put in there and then uh, put in cases. So if it is browse, what do I want it to do? I want it to, I want it to run the want it to run the browse function. And after a case, what do I need to put in? Break. You Break. got it. Okay, so let's do the same thing for read.
And I'm also going to put in a default. And that all that the default is going to do is just say, uh, Adverb, and then I am going to run the client.end. So you've seen what I've done here. I've moved all, most of the logic for these case statements out into functions. I find this easier to read. I could have put the entire function inside the switch, but I think this is better. I think this makes it easier. What am I looking at? I'm looking at a switch statement. Okay, great. What does the switch statement do? It runs either browse or read, depending on what's passed. And if nothing is passed or the bad, a bad thing is passed, it's going to pass bad verb. If it does pass bad verb, we need to run client.end. We're always going to run client.end. So we should always get return to our prompt. All right, let's see if this works. Uh, let's see, there we go. So we're going to run node index.js and I'm gonna pass in browse. Perfect, it works. I'm gonna pass in read and I'm gonna pass in two. Perfect, I get the book back that I want. Uh, what happens if I pass in read without an argument? Let's have a look. Uh, I get an empty array back. Does that surprise anybody? It's the values array. Yeah, uh, basically it's, it does a search on the database and gets nothing back. So it says, hey, here are all the rows that you asked for. There aren't any, but here they are. Because computers are dumb and they don't know what you want. You have to tell them explicitly what you want. John, I have a quick question about the dollar sign one. Yes. The array. Is that a JavaScript thing or is that a PG? No, thing? That's, a, that's a PG thing. Okay. Right. So what I'm actually, what I can do here is I can show, um, let's inside the response, I'm gonna do console.log and um, I'm gonna pass in, oh no, hold on. Yeah, not an easy way for me to actually send back the query. Um, yeah, I could do actually here, here. So I'm just gonna extract this query. equals and I'm going to do it the old way. Or the, the way I told you not to do it, just so you can have a look. So it's going to say, I can type. Okay, and if I console.log this query here, I can see what the query would have been. So let's run it again. And instead of passing one, two, I'm going to read 
uh, one colon drop table. And I think I need to put that in a string. There we go. All right, so it actually errored. But you can see here, oh yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's sent the select star from, there we go. This is exactly what it said. So it doesn't like that. It's giving me errors because of what I've got afterwards. Invalid, in, uh, oh, I just have the wrong syntax. That's fine, I think it's drop tables books, but you can see why that would be a very bad idea. The doing this is uh, basically replaces it with actual text. So you don't actually have to worry about it. Well, it gives an error back, right? Because it's trying to put in a search of one semicolon drop table books. Obviously that's going to come back with, I have no idea what you're doing. And that's exactly what happened. So if I do the same thing and send it a four, there, it worked. So let me put right here, Don't do this. Really, don't. It's a bad idea. It will only cause you grief and heartache. OK, any other questions? Uh, I'm just curious about uh, when it returned the empty array. Mm -hmm. um, I, maybe I'm not understanding how the switch statement works, but I'm just curious why the console bad console log bad verb wasn't printed Okay, so let's actually get bad verb to come back. So instead of read, I'm going to put in blah, right? So this should error absolutely. There we go. It errored absolutely. Read is completely valid. What was happening was it was reading or attempting to read that third or sorry, second uh argument, not finding anything, and just running the query without anything there. So it was actually running select star where ID equals nothing. And it was coming back with an empty array. So it, we would not, the verb was good. It was just the argument was missing. So I could put some logic in my program that say, if I don't add a number, it will give me back a, uh, you know, a default, or it will say, hey, hey, stupid, add a number. There's all sorts of logic I can add to this to make this more robust if I wanted this to be a real application. Okay. You guys are awesome. You're so awesome, in fact, that I'm going to give you a 10-minute break. And by you, I mean me. I'm going to give me a 10-minute break. You can do whatever you want for 10 minutes. That's fine. So we'll start back up at 5 after the hour. All right? Awesome. Thanks, all.
Hey, Allison. Hello. Maybe people are waiting till 2.06, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's, 
It's fine. It's fine. Both of my parents were um, ex-military, so I start to panic when I'm late for something. Um, just sort of built into me. So, but I'm I'm aware that not everybody is like you and I, Allison. Exactly. I, I'm always one of these people who has to wear a watch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though I'm not always on time, but. Uh, yeah, my my watch is actually. Uh, on a stand right in front of me right now. <laughs> so, but that's all good. All right, welcome back everyone. Okay, that was cool, wasn't it? I, I, I kind of enjoy, uh, I, I love working with Node uh, and databases. Okay, let's do something else. Uh, I know for a fact that uh, all of you uh, have been playing with Express. So let's make an Express app that accesses our books. How cool is that? So let's do that. I am just gonna run this app in the same folder because I've already got everything set up. So might as well just do it. So I'm gonna create a new file. I'm gonna call it server.js, okay, and let me see, what's the first thing I want to do? I want to actually import Express, okay, mpmix, okay, wonderful, added 50 packages. See, you never open that up. This is where, never, don't ever worry about this folder. Yes, there are a million folders in here and it's only gonna get worse, but this is where insanity lies. Always leave your node modules folder closed. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do is bring in Express. And if it makes people feel better, um, I actually use Express today in, in, in my other life. Express is a very useful tool. Uh, it is getting a little dated. It's been around for a while and I don't think there've been updates in a couple of years, but it's solid and it does what it says on the label. So. That's good. What's the next thing I need to do after requiring Express? Const app. Yep. Yeah, to Express to call. Okay. Great. So I've got my app. Okay. And I love putting in my app thought listen first. I'm going to say app.listen. Um, I'm going to say on port. And I will have my callback. And callback will just do a console.log. All right, perfect. Uh, so I better create that variable. So let's do that. So equals, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use my .emv setup, right? So I know that I can use dot env, so let's import it. Um, okay, and that will allow me to say process dot env dot and I have to capitalize this. So uh, the reason I'm capitalizing port here 
is it's just, uh, again, one of those conventions, this is a constant that is uh, going to be uh, running in the app. So it's usual to uppercase this. There's no special magic about making that uppercase, it just is. So let's go into here and I'm gonna create another variable called port. And I'm gonna say the port is gonna to equal to 7575. I just made that number up off the top of my head. It doesn't matter what the port is. Don't make it too big though. Four digit number will be fine. All right, so um, I just have to and allow. Again, you don't have to do that. And I'm gonna go back to my server and I'm gonna say that if for whatever reason, the port isn't there, we're going to use seven, five, six, seven. There we go. So all this is going to do is gonna check, does this variable exist? If it does, great. If it doesn't, fall back to that port. So this is why I have port down here. The port can be variable. And again, if I'm deploying this to several different environments, I'm going to want to run this on uh, particular ports. If I'm running a, an express app on the actual internet, how, what port do I need to use? 80. 80 or 443. Uh, 443 is the secure version and 80 is the uh, regular unsecured HTTP. Either will work. Okay, let's create a route. So how do I do that? App dot what? Stop giving hints to everybody. Yeah. Got it. All right, so let's just create a uh, test. And I, and then my favorite, REQ request RES, that arrow. And I am going to say response res response dot send any cowboy bebop fans here and that's why the TV show failed. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's, uh, let's see this work. So I'm gonna start her up. Uh, okay, great. Let's open up a new window. Just pull this over here and... And it says cannot get slash. That is correct. So let's go to the slash test endpoint. There we go. It works. I have a working Express app. It doesn't do anything, but it works. So I'll, uh, I, I love going little steps and then going to the next point. Okay, I, I've got a working Express app. That's fantastic. So the next thing I want to do is I want to um, I want to have a an endpoint that pulls up the books. All right. So Let's create another endpoint. Am I confusing anybody with the word endpoint? An endpoint is a, an API URL. 
So APIs provide resources at a particular URL. So it's going to make sense that I create an endpoint called books. And then the callback. Recres. Okay, so what do I want to run in here? So let's actually uh, cheat. It's not cheating, but let's have a look here. So how did I read the database here? I created a client. So I imported the uh, PG, I created the client, I got the config object. I did all of this. All right, fantastic. So I've got all, um, so what I want to do is going to be very similar to this read function here. So I can actually steal a lot from this app Let, and let's do that. Um, and let's actually create a, a separate file to put these things in because if you put everything in one file, it gets unwieldy very, very quickly. All right, so let us create a new file and we'll call this uh, query.js. All right, and here's where I'm basically just going to grab a lot of this. Here, we'll grab to there, okay. And I'm going to put this in query. See how much time I just saved? Okay, so this is going to be the same. This is going to be the same. This is going to be the same, 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 same. We're going to connect. Great. And I don't need the verb. So I need to access this browse feature or this browse um, browse function. So I'm going to export it, all right? How do I export a function? Module exports. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it inside a, uh, an object. Am I blowing anybody's mind by just putting browse here? When you put uh, browse, it's going to just pull in this right here. It's going to add this as a method to that object. So I can create a number of different functions here that do different things. I can then export them and uh, then I can import them into my server. So let's do that. Let's import our, where should I put that? Let's put that right here. Uh, we're going to call it queries equals require. And I have to give the relative path, which is dot slash uh, query. Note I don't have to put dot JS after it, right? It just assumes it's a JavaScript file. If I'm importing it into JavaScript, it should be JavaScript, okay? So I've got this queries. So I'm here in this app.get. So what do I want to do? Well, I want to run that browse or I access that browse through the queries object. Now, 
Now let's go back here uh, to the query. Um, I'm also going to get rid of this. And I don't want to console.log the response.rows. I'm going to return the response.rows. All right. Console.logging it will put it in the console, which is not going to be useful to me at this point. I'm also not closing the connection. I'm not closing the connection because I have an app and maybe I want to make another query at some point. So I want that connection to stay open the entire time. Okay. So I am returning response.rows here. And when I go back to the server, I'm getting the browse. Now, luckily, as you as I noted here, uh, this is a venable object. And whenever you pass something out of a venable object, it too is venable. So what I can do is after queries.browse, I can do a dot ben. And we'll take the data. And what am I going to do with the data? So what I can do actually is I can res dot send the data. Okay. And I'm not using the request object anywhere. So I'm going to put an underscore in front of it. This is again, another convention. The underscore itself doesn't give any functionality, but it informs VS Code or other coders who are reading my code later down the road that even though I am using that in the function, or I'm at least calling it as a uh, argument in my function, I'm not using it because it's always going to send the request and the response object. So even though I get this thing, I don't need to use it. All right. So Let's have a look. Does this work? So I'm going to stop this and I'm going to restart. Okay. 7575, my test works. Does books work? Cross your fingers. Cannot read property of undefined. Reading then. Oh, did I lie? Did I lie? I hope I didn't lie. So queries.browse uh, here. I think I lied. Uh, unintentionally, of course. So I'm going to just console.log this and restart, refresh. Nothing's going to appear there. But I'm getting undefined here. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, res dot send. Oh, I think I need. Hmm. Hold on. I'm thinking uh, if I run queries dot browse okay here actually let's do that here okay and we start and it's returning undefined. So I did something wrong with the query. Select star from books and then response. Am I connecting to the client? Yeah, DB connected. Oh, okay. So it's 
attempting to return information before the database is connected. That's, uh, that's useful to know. Okay, let me just have a look at my cheat sheet. What did I do wrong? So uh, client.query, then response. Call, oh, callback, right, 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 right. Okay, so I'm gonna just change this up a little bit. And I'm gonna have my browse take a function and that function is a callback. So this is going to be a function that I'm gonna pass in. And then what I can do, Again, looking at that, I can do my client.query response, great. And then instead of returning response.rows, I'm going to run response.rows through the callback. Remember that you can pass functions as arguments to other functions. All right, and let's also be good citizens here and do a dot catch uh, error. Dot error. Okay, super. So now that means I have to come into the server and when I call queries.browse, I have to pass it a, uh, an object or a function, I should say. And that is going to take, yeah, let's kill this. So I'm gonna make this an anonymous function that takes the rows. And that res dot send. Okay, this should work, this should work. So let's disconnect and I'm going to uh, run nodemon. Just so I don't have to keep restarting it, it will just automatically restart for me. Okay, let's go back and try one more time. So let's go to books. This is the John feels like he knows what he's doing uh, pose. Yep, there we go. So I have done a query against the books and I can now access that. I have effectively built my own API. So if you're running this code and you go to localhost 7575, slash books, you will get the books. This opens up a ton of possibilities because now I can do different things with the books. I can create a method that will add a book to the list. I can create an, another method to delete a book from the list. I can even do something like add um, EJS view engine here. And I can have that EJS uh display the books itself what uh what format is that coming back in that is json ah. uh so i have a plugin here that makes json look pretty um here where is my uh, i am mr add-on hold on No, I don't want to find more. I want to find the one that's there, JSON view. So let me just turn off JSON view and come back here, refresh. Oh, and now it is, never mind. Uh, so um, it turns out that since I last tried, uh, Firefox has a built in JSON viewer. So I never needed that in the first place. There we go. But 
Um, is there a way for me to show the raw, raw data? There we go. And that's what's actually being returned. So it is just getting back that. And then my, uh, my browser is importing that. And I can, it's showing this data, but if I actually connect it to an endpoint with another app, say a front end app, I can then consume that API and do whatever it is I want with it. In this case, I'm just browsing the books, but I could create another endpoint to read a particular book. Cool. John, I just have a quick, I'm trying to wrap my head around how yep. the, how we connected to the database and by, and we ran server .node server mm -hmm. we required the, required the document query.js, which has the, the connection in it. Mm -hmm. um, is that, is that, is that what's happening is you just, yeah. you require. I'm query. pulling in this file into my server JS. So server JS is the root uh, JavaScript file for this application. The application is then this is, or this file, the query is doing all the database stuff. So I don't have to worry about uh, polluting my server. My server is just straight express, easy to read. All of the actual database manipulation is in this file. Now, this is a very simple app and I've only got 31 lines of code counting comments and spaces and such. So tiny, tiny, tiny. But you can imagine if I had multiple tables and multiple, uh, you know, I not only just gets, but updates, deletes, uh, th this could get very large. And then I could take some of those, say uh, I create a different file for all of the methods on a particular table. And I move that to another file. So, my aim here is to keep all of my files as small and easy to read as possible. Because someday you're going to be a programmer, uh, a paid developer, and you're going to be shown a file and that file is over a thousand lines long and you're going to be asked to debug it and it's going to take you four days to figure it out. Okay, th thanks. I, I, um Sorry, I, I speak from experience. Just a quick follow up question. And I'm just trying to, um, so yep. you require query.js. It actually yep. runs through query and it actually runs line 16 client.connect. Yep. Um, it, the browse, um, the function expression browse on line 23 yep. is read into memory, presumably. Yeah, I'm, uh, so it's whenever you, uh, declare a variable. In this case, I'm declaring a variable it just so happens to be a function and it is stored in, in memory so that I can access that. Okay. So, so then, then you do a module exports browse. Mm -hmm. um, if it's already in mem memory, could we call um, in back in server.js, could we call query.browse or something? Or do we, do we need the module exports is what I'm trying to, to get at? No, we need it because it needs, that file needs to run. And I need to be able to access the, uh, the browse function here. If I do, if I add without importing queries, if I try and run this, well, first of all, that file's not gonna run. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I was thinking, sorry, go on. And second of all, it has no idea now what queries is. It's going to undefined. Right. I, I was thinking of the other way around. If you required query, but you didn't module exports browse. I, I'm just trying to. Um... Well, there's nothing like changing stuff up. Okay, so let's uh, let's kill and that. Called browse, like, I don't know what do you, did you, um, save query as a con as a variable in server.js? Uh, server.js queries is require query. Okay, so now could you run queries.browse? Yeah, sure. Well, I can uh, just hit the endpoint. 
queries.browse is not a function. So it doesn't okay. know what browse is. I have to export it from the queries uh, object that I'm exporting from that, uh, that file. Now, I'm calling it queries here, right? I'm assigning the name queries. I could call this whatever I want. Now, right now I'm just calling it queries because that makes sense to me. So let me fix this. So I can access whatever I export. I'm not exporting the rest of this because my server doesn't need to know any of this. All my server wants to know is how to browse. Which okay, case, so if, just exporting that. Okay, so if you want to run some code like the client.connect and, and things like that, you, you don't need to actually export that. But if you want to bring in a, a function that you need to call in another, yep. in another um, file, then you need to export it. Exactly. Okay, thank you. That, that clears it up. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no, no worries. As a matter of fact, you'll see that this uh, line here, DB connected, this is telling you that this is running because that DB connected is in the query file. Is it in the query? Yeah, there we go, right there. So this is line 17 of the query file that's running. Here, this running on port 7575 is on the server here, Jang. Uh, yes, John, uh, quick question. Uh, can we just uh, require the browse function like in the curly braces? Uh, yeah, in, I in could. This... So ab absolutely, I could destructure, destructure this object. So I do, don't even need to refer to queries. What I can do, uh, a bit more advanced here, is I can create an object here and I can say browse. And then instead of query stop browse, all I need to do is call browse and it will work just the same. There we go. So I'm destructuring using object-based destructuring uh, the import. I did it the other way because it I didn't want to confuse too many people. But this is completely valid. Matter of fact, if I were writing this code today, I would do it this way. Well, if I'm writing this code for pay right now, actually, no, I'm getting paid. Never mind. Um, but this is the way I, I would do it professionally. I would uh, destructure. Destructuring is a superpower for developers. Didn't exist 10 years ago. Now I can't imagine coding without it. And I have one more follow up question. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Why do we use the callback in the promise and there? Uh, what was that? Uh... Right. So this is so I was exporting the exporting the function. Uh, it wasn't doing exactly what I expected. Uh, and that's quite common. So what I was expecting was to get back uh, a venable, but actually the venable is this. And I was getting back this, which is the entire function. So I thought, how do I get something out of, out of that? Well, I can just pass it a function. Um, you're gonna see this pattern a lot, right? How do I get information out of one file and into another file? Use a callback so I can run functions in, from one file in another file. So this callback is a parameter. As a matter of fact, you could see right here. Well, it says parameter callback any. This callback is a function in this case. And because it won't make sense for it to be anything other than a function. This callback could be any function. I could, for instance, Instead of doing this browse rows, um, console.logs a function. This is completely valid. Let's see what happens. This will come back. But you'll also notice that now also everything got 
written to the console. This is the console for the server. This is my client. This is the web browser that is accessing that API. Excellent questions, guys. So now I am running browse twice. I'm running it once and passing the console.log function. I'm also now running it a second time and using it to tell it to run res.send or results.send the rows, the rows being the data that I get from this function, right? Remember a function returns a value. So this is returning the, the data that I need. And then with that data, I'm passing it into this res.send on the server. The server is then sending it to the client. So it can get a little bit confusing about what server and what's client, especially when you're developing and it's all on the same machine. If, I'm, if I can access it in a web browser, it's a client. So I am sending data to the client. I'm sending it with this res.send. I'm not sending any of the rest of the data to the client. The client just receives this. Uh, if, oh, I think I might be able to, um, let's look at network and let's refresh. Okay, there we go. So don't worry about this line. I don't have a favicon. No big deal, but if you actually have a look here in the network tab, I have a 304 not modified, okay? It's just telling, uh, it's just saying, hey, it, nothing's changed since the last time you, you asked for this data. But if I cleared the cache, it would actually pull the data. And you can actually have a look at this. Um, where is it? No. It's, here we go. Um, I, I used to know how to do all this, hold on. Uh, here we go. And here's the information for, not that one. Is it? Hold on. Headers, cookies, headers. And this. This is hilarious. Uh, so a cookie is being set. Don't look at that. <laughs> That's actually a work thing. But here's the response headers that are being sent. You can actually see X powered by Express. So that is being sent by the server and the response itself is all of this information right here. So this is the response. My browser gets the response and there's no styling information. As far as it could tell, this is just a string of information. So how does a browser display a string? Just printing it to the screen. So it actually receives that and prints it to the screen. It's the browser itself, uh, a pl the plugin or, or, or pretty print on the browser realizes, oh, it's JSON. He probably wants to troubleshoot or do some development work on that. Ultimately, I'm just sending a string. Okay. Well, I am going to leave it there. I think. I think. Uh, I think everybody's brains are full, or at least mine is. All right, my friends. You guys are the best class I have ever had this year. No, no. <laughs> All right, maybe may, may more than just this year. Um, yeah, uh, so there is actually quite a lot uh, to express and connecting database, but hopefully I've shown you enough. Uh, Bill, I'm gonna send some notes uh, that have a bit more information 
and you can go over that. I'm also going to post the video. Thank you, Umar, if you're here, you're not, um, for letting me know that there was a problem with my last video. Uh, I always intend to make it work. So, all right. If any last questions before we finish up? Nope. No. Yeah, I have one question. Sorry. So uh, I was in the impression that we can't. Uh, I mean, uh, the the promises were introduced to get rid of callbacks, but we can use callbacks and the promises. Of yeah, the yeah. There, there are different ways of doing that. Um, so when I'm thinking, like when I'm teaching, and I have to go quickly, I do it the easiest way. That there is probably a better way for me to do that. In this case. I've used a callback. I can probably do something else and just use a, uh, a promise. Uh, I probably could, for instance, unwrap that, uh, that, uh, that call I made in the query and just, you know, get that, okay, it's tenable, so I should be able to add to it. So it's one of those things. So I just said, oh, what's the easiest way for me to fix this? Callback. Yeah, gotcha. Thanks, thanks. When in I, doubt, go to what you're familiar with. Yeah. Um, I have one more question. Yep. Uh, so um, you want to keep the connection to the database open. Mm -hmm. But when when would you end it? Like um, when my like, web server shuts down. OK, so when the client disconnects, then. Uh, uh, yeah, the client disconnects is fine. Yeah, because it's my server itself that needs the is accessing the database. The client is not accessing the database. The client's accessing the server. Okay. Right, yeah. and the, then the server is accessing the database. So I would only want to close that when I close down my web server, right? Because yeah, a website, I was only one person on that website, but in theory, multiple people can connect, connect to that website and they may have different requests that they send through and that's fine. There's also, uh, I did the, uh, the client there. Um, how did I do this again? Hold on. It is, right. So I did the client.connect. There's also, uh, the Postgres also has something, uh, 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 an idea called a pool, which it allows multiple connections to happen simultaneously. One of the drawbacks of using the client, pg.client, is that it only does one thing at a time. It does it very fast, so it's probably okay. But if you are running an enterprise level database application, You'll probably want to use a pool of connections so that multiple people can simultaneously use the app. See what happens when you ask questions? I give you too much information. Yeah, it's a can of worms now. It, welcome to development, Gottfried. Everything's a can of worms. I was just curious because you took out the end connection from the function. Yeah. I didn't want to end the connection. I want to leave that open, right? If I end it and I make another database connection or an, a, ask for another piece of information from the database, I'm not going to be able to get it because the connection is ended. The server, the life cycle of the server means that the connection should stay open for as many queries as I want. The client, clients will send their queries one at a time and I will answer them one at a time. But if I had to open and close the connection every time, that's overhead I don't need. So I'm just going to open a connection. I'm going to leave it open for the life cycle of my web app, the web server, and then I'm going to close it afterwards or close it when I kill the, the app. Does it close automatically? Does the connection close automatically or do you need a line of code in your server? Nope, it does not close automatically. Okay. It will keep open in theory forever. Uh, if there's like, you know, obviously if your database goes down or your, uh, your web server goes down for whatever reason, 
you might need to reset that up. So that's, again, you want to put some hardening into your application. So what happens if the database dies and comes back up? Do I, I should probably reconnect at that point. That's not likely to happen, but it could. So, so would you put that end piece of code on the server page or on the database uh, uh, page? My web server, I don't need it to end. I don't want it to end. When I was writing my command line app, I wanted that to end because I wanted to go back to my, my prompt. I want to run it. Once I've run it, I'm done. And I don't need to do anything else after that. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay. All right. Last call for questions. I'm a little worried because I've done this three times now. Okay. Uh, there's a few of you who I will contact regarding uh, your uh, code reviews. Uh, I've done others of you and others of you, someone else is going to do it. So there's only, I think I'm down to three left. So three people I will do code reviews for. We'll figure it out. I have to go back to my other job now, but um, you know, maybe during my lunch period uh, sometime this week, we'll, we'll, we can do something. We'll figure it out. So uh, if you're in that category, um, I'll organize it somehow. I am the least organized professor you're ever going to have, though. OK. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks. Great Thanks class. So much. Great class. Thank I you. loved it. Thank you. You're welcome.